Well, that music, of course, means it is time for my Sunday sermon, and I'm going to focus on Jeremy Hunt's budget. And I want you to grab a pen or paper, a pen and, or pencil and a bit of paper, just to run through some numbers, because I'm going to prove why this austerity, why these tax rises were totally, utterly unnecessary. And yet, they made the political choice to make all of us who go to work poorer. That's what they did. Quite rightly, the only good news in the budget was that the Chancellor chose to give pensioners an inflation-linked increase. That was the right decision. But the bad news is he's decided to tax those of us who go to work, who stress, who strive, who create, who build, who design, who manufacture, who drive, who take risk with our own money. He decided that we should get less reward for that. He'd make us poorer, even though he didn't need to. There was no discussion about cutting out waste. There was no discussion about how he should get the 1.5 million people off benefits and back into work who were in work in 2019. No discussion at all. So the net result is that someone who's on relatively modest pay, they're actually paying more in tax. They're taking home less. But someone who's paid to sit at home on out-of-work benefits is doing better, is getting a big increase. So they've got more at the end of each week. And yes, cost of living has got up, but where's the incentive to get up, to go to work, to achieve, to contribute? Where's that incentive if you are paid less? It is literally economic madness. If you're going to tax more for those in work, and tax less for those who are out of work and pay them more. Your problems will deepen. I want you to think of, just imagine, a still calm lake. And at the end of that lake, there's a waterfall. There's a boat on the lake, you're sitting in it, and the guy at the front of the boat, calling out directions, is the Prime Minister Sunak. The guy at the back with the, with the tiller, that's the Chancellor. And rather than take the, the, the boat towards a path of growth and prosperity, these two, they're taking the boat nearer and nearer the waterfall. And here's the thing. Once water goes over a waterfall, it ain't coming back. You're not coming back. The water's gone. And if the boat goes over the waterfall, it's doom. And that is where these two are taking our economy. Surely the idea of Brexit was to look after British workers, not punish them. We've got the highest tax take since the Second World War. It's unbelievable. Tell me, what actually works in Britain? Now, with your pen and paper, let's just look at what he should have done, how he could have saved some money without having to tax us anymore. First up, the renewable in industry. We're told by lots and lots of people that renewable energy is the cheapest and we should have more of it. Well, if so, why are we still subsidising the renewable industry? 11 billion in inflation-linked subsidies. Clearly, if it's the cheapest, then they don't need those subsidies anymore. So that's the first 11 billion, straight off. Now, as I just touched on, a million and a half more people are on out-of-work benefits than pre-COVID. Well, if there was some focus and some determination to help train and support those back into work, when we're told there's a labour shortage, we're told unemployment is at record lows, so it shouldn't be difficult to get these people back into work rather than importing cheap overseas labour, guess how much that would save? 20 to £25 billion pounds a year. But no discussion from Jeremy Hunt whatsoever. Now, there's another important issue which is a bit complicated. But you'll have heard of this quantitative easing, all of the debt that was issued essentially by the Bank of England called quantitative easing, which essentially they printed money, they've left it on their computer at the Bank of England. If you turned all of that, you reorganised all of that into a 75-year warlike corona bond and you fixed it at a nominal rate of interest of 2%, that would save another 10 to 15 billion pounds in nominal interest payments every single year. And it would reduce the refinance and interest rate risk that the markets have expressed their concern about. But again, 
I've been talking about this for a year. Nothing from Sunak and Hunt. They're supposed to be bright. They're supposed to understand this stuff. If you're keeping up, so far, that's 41 to 51 billion quid. It's not even half time, folks. It's not even time for the oranges. I'm just warming up. I've still got the tracksuit bottoms on for the numbers about to come. I've talked before about all of us saving five quid in a hundred in our budget to about small businesses saying, well, I need to save five quid in a hundred. If the Chancellor said to every single manager of every spending department across government, across quangos, across local authorities, you've got to save five quid in a hundred. Bearing in mind, there's only two types of government spending, remember. There's useful government spending and there's wasteful government spending. Are you telling me that you can't save five quid in a hundred whilst protecting frontline services? I bet if he said to everyone, save it or you're fired, guess what? They'd save it. Five quid in a hundred. That's 50 billion, folks. 50 billion quid. Now, moving on. Energy. Well, you heard it from the Chancellor in his budget that they're going to have increased energy bills next year. They're going to lift the cap on the energy. But again, he's still asking the taxpayer to pay the cost of this. I've said it before. We're in a global energy war. Terrorists are blowing up gas pipelines. When we're in an energy war, the government has to take control of critical items of production like, like energy. The government should be saying to the UK producers of energy, you're going to get the revenues that you got in 2021, not the enhanced prices of 2022 or 23. That would save about another 50 billion. I know these numbers are big. They really are big. But if you're keeping up with your pen and your paper, we're well over. We're about 150 billion quid so far. And I've not finished. No, I've not finished. Because then we've got HS2. Now, in the world of business, there's an expression. The first loss is the best loss. The worst thing to do is to pour good money after bad. We've even had a report in the last couple of weeks that the value for money has slipped below a pound for every pound spent of this vanity, egotistical project. It was supposed to cost 38 billion. The latest budgets are well over 100 billion. I'm telling you, it'll be well over 150 billion if it's finished. I think they've spent 20 to 30 billion so far. So guess what? If we scrapped it now, you'd save a net 100 billion. Sorry, you'd save a gross 100 billion. And let's spend, let's say, 50 billion of that in the north, on the woeful infrastructure in the north, on east-west infrastructure in the north. So if our gross saving is 100 billion and we spend 50 billion in the north, that's a net saving of 50 billion. How's your maths going, folks? So if we top that lot up, just do the maths, adding it up, yes, we're around 190 to 200 billion pounds without raising a single penny of tax on a single working individual in this country. You see where I'm going with this? It's all about political choices. And I think I've just proven that this Chancellor and this Prime Minister, they could have made all those choices and then cut taxes on consumer goods, which would have cut inflation. And if you cut taxes on small businesses, they invest more, you get more growth. And if you cut taxes for the lowest paid, you get a greater multiplier factor. As that money bubbles up the economy, you get more growth. But no, Jeremy Hunt made the political choice as a Tory, in my view as a con-socialist Tory, he made the choice to tax us all more if we wake up in the morning and go to work. Now you could argue with a few billion here and there about my maths, you could pick and choose one or two of those items on the list, folks. Fine. You're still well over 100 billion. And they said there was a 50 billion black hole. Do you see what I'm doing? I'm showing that he made a deliberate, brutal, political choice to make everybody who goes to work poorer. That is the reality of what happened. He made a choice to make it harder for the engine of our economy small businesses. 
He was aided and abetted in this choice by the Prime Minister. No discussion at all about growth. It's almost like a dirty word because Liz Truss dared to talk about growth, growth, growth. It was about the only sensible thing she said when she was Prime Minister. And growth matters. I think you may know I came back from Australia a couple of weeks back. In Australia, they have over 3% growth regularly. If we had grown at the same rate as Australia for the last 15 years until 2019, we'd have another 150 billion every year of tax. That's the equivalent of another NHS every single year. That is the power of growth. And that is the choice that the Chancellor decided not to make. Truly, truly extraordinary. Truly unbelievable. Just look at that bit of paper. You tot up those maths, you look at those choices. Not a single one of those involves taxing individuals. And yet, that's what they decided to do. They decided to reduce the incentive to go to work. They refused to talk about growth. And they didn't even think about cutting spending. No, it turns out that actually real spending over the next couple of years is going up. This is what socialists do. You tax more and you spend more. Hang on, I thought these people were conservatives. No, no, they're not. How can they be if they tax more and spend more? They must be socialists. Is that why the Chancellor decided to employ a former Labour minister to help him with a bit of efficiency in the health service? Is that why he decided to appoint a former Labour advisor, Sir Michael Barber, to help him on education? Really? Are there no competent, capable people on the Conservative side? Well, perhaps not, as they've all become consocialists. Are there no international experts out there who could have helped on those items? No. The consocialist Chancellor, I don't think, he's definitely not a Conservative, is he? He made the choice to employ Labour advisers, Labour ministers. He must be some form of socialist. I'm absolutely shocked. I'm gutted. I'm furious. But folks, stay with me. We must never give up. We will battle and we will fight this absurdity, this economic madness that will destroy our economy. It will send us over the edge of that waterfall and send us down into a doom loop. We must never give up. I believe ultimately we can and we must prevail. Here endeth my Sunday sermon.